Our speaker for this hour is certainly known to us quite well, has already spoken once, Brother Danny Douglas, is native of Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. He's been preaching the gospel on a regular basis since 1977, has served churches in Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, and Virginia, as well as full-time mission work in the Ukraine and United Kingdom. He worked in public education for about 10 years. He served as a teacher, a principal, and college instructor, and he's now involved in the business world. He's preached on the radio for about 20 years. He has been one of our teachers when we worked in the Truth Bible Institute, and he currently is preaching at the Central Church of Christ, Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, and he works for Transamerica Insurance Company. He has also worked much in the Philippines, and he's blessed with a faithful support, dedicated wife, doing the Lord's work, the Arnie Tabalon. They're blessed with two children, Lydia and Daniel Moses. Daniel Moses is with us today. He's going to preach too shortly. And we're grateful for him. Danny's a dedicated preacher of the gospel, defender of the faith. As I said the other day, one of the most conscientious men I've ever seen. And I hope that you will listen to what he has to say on the subject, the fatal error on spiritual gifts. Brother Danny, come speak to us. Same way. Thank you, Brother Brown. Indeed, it's a privilege and a blessing to be here today. I thank the Lord for the honor and privilege to be here with the Lord's Church at Spring, involved in the Continuing for the Faith lectures, and I appreciate the godly elders here and godly faithful elders and gospel preacher, and Brother Brown, and appreciate these men and their faithful wives and families, and also many other faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in this congregation and from other places that who are here today and we're so thankful for each and every one of you. Again, I want to thank Brother and Sister Brown for their gracious hospitality, as always, in being in their home. And we appreciate and love them so much and the congregation here and all the hospitality that is extended. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. And we're thankful to God for this. I did my, I made an observation this week during the lectures, I've noticed the children and young people and how much they have enjoyed this and gotten out of this lectureship, including my son Daniel. I'm thankful to have him with me. But I've heard and overheard things and seen things indicating that they have really paid attention and enjoyed this lectureship. Now, sometimes we might think, as older people, we might get discouraged because we wish that we had more numbers or that some people more showed more interest. But we're doing more good than we think we are sometimes because the older as well as the young have gained a lot of out of this. And I want to say this for myself personally, that I have been amazed at the knowledge and the wisdom that I've heard from other brethren this week from the pulpit here and also in conversations, I, I've learned and grown myself. And I'm so thankful for that and appreciative for it. You know, if you have been able to attend these lectures but willfully chose not to and did not do so, then my friend, I hope that you will turn around in that practice because you are depriving yourself of a great blessing and a great treasure and wealth of knowledge. I heard about a preacher one time that he got up to preach and he really knew the scriptures and he was very impressive in his knowledge and preaching of the gospel. And a lady afterwards said to him, she said, I would give the world if I knew the Bible like you. And he told her, he said, that's exactly what I've had to give. You know, friends, if we're going to know the word and be faithful, joyful, and fruitful in the Lord, we have to sacrifice some of these earthly and worldly pursuits. And I don't necessarily mean things that are intrinsically evil, but things that are just earthly in nature. 
We have to give up some of those things. If we're really, really going to know the word and be the faithful and fruitful servants that we need to be. Paul said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I want to mention something else here before we get into the topic, and that is the Continuing for the Faith radio. That's continuingforthefaith.org, and Brother Ralph Fisher is doing good work with that. And you can hear sermons all the time online. And so I know there are people that will see this over the Internet and maybe even live right now, as well as those here today. Please take advantage of this and other opportunity to learn and to grow in Christ by tuning into that as well as to the website here and all these lectures that will be in archive fashion. Now... I want to say this too, that it is a blessing not only to teach positive things, but also to warn. Because warning is part of the work that we do. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, that's negative. Well, the Lord was negative at times, wasn't he? And so was Paul and the other apostles. If something keeps you from losing your physical life, although it may require a negative procedure, you'd be thankful for it, wouldn't you? If something will keep us from losing our eternal souls and losing congregations from the faith, isn't it worth it? Now, the word fatal is not really found in the King James or the American Standard Version of the Bible. But yet, the Greek word thanatos is deadly, Revelation 13, verses 3 and 12, and in Mark 16, 18, where it speaks of deadly poison, and in James 3, 8, referring to the tongue as a deadly poison, fatal is that which brings or causes death. And false doctrine is more dangerous and deadlier than a deadly snake or a deadly poison or any other things that bring fa fatal physical harm. In that false doctrine causes people to lose their souls for all eternity. Now what's worse? To lose one's life or to lose one's soul? Jesus made that point plain, didn't he? In Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now the foolishness of these fatal false doctrines on the Holy Spirit reminds me of a story that maybe you've heard this, about this man who went to a faith healing service. He went to one of these faith healers. And he asked them to pray for his hearing. And so these so-called faith healers, they prayed and they prayed and they prayed for his hearing. And when they finished praying, they said, now how's your hearing? He said, I don't know yet until I stand before the judge tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> these things are pretty foolish, aren't they? But yet many people are going after fatal error on these matters of the Holy Spirit. Fatal error on spiritual gifts is what we are considering. Now we talk about erring, and error we're talking about going astray from God. King Saul said to David in 1 Samuel 26, 21, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Now these false teachers, whether within the church or without, who are teaching fatal error on the Holy Spirit are erring exceedingly. And like King Saul, I'm afraid that many of them are never going to repent. And they're going to lose their souls in eternity. But not only this, those who listen to these false teachers are going to lose their souls also. If they listen to those teaching fatal error. Now James said, and many people need to heed this. Do not err, my beloved brethren. James 1.16. 
And James teaches us the deadliness of going back into error, whether it be doctrinal error, moral error, or any other kind of error. He said, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. James 5, verse 19 and 20. So James says that the end result of going away from the truth and into error is death. But he's not talking about physical death, although we know that sin brought physical death into the world. But here he's talking about a separation from God. And if that error or sin is not repented of, that individual will have to undergo the second death, which is the lake of fire and brimstone, Revelation 21, verse 8, for all eternity. As Jesus will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. So cannot we see why that false doctrine is more dangerous than those things which bring physical death? Now when we go over to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 2, we have here a description of false teachers. And we see their result, their end, as well as those who would follow them. Beginning at verse 1, the apostle declares, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily, that is, privately, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. What a terrible thing to deny the Lord who shed his precious blood to redeem us and to purchase our souls, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, to deny the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that is ultimately what these false teachers are doing, regardless what the fatal false doctrine is. But notice the fatality of the matter. These things are called damnable heresies. They bring upon themselves swift destruction. And verse 2 said, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Are we surprised and amazed at how many people, even in the church, will go trancing after false doctrine? Well, Peter warned by inspiration of the Spirit that many will follow their pernicious ways. Then in verse number 3, and through covetousness, and this tells us a reason that many do this, that many teach false doctrine, the love of money. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Again, these words are in keeping with the destruction of the soul, speaking of their judgment and the fact that their damnation slumbereth not. But now, as we look in more detail at fatal error on spiritual gifts this morning, let us notice the nature of the spiritual gifts and their purpose. Now, I realize that this has already been dealt with this week, but yet it doesn't hurt to repeat it. As we know, the three keys of learning, repetition, repetition, repetition. So let's look at the nature of the spiritual gifts and their purpose. As we go to the book of Mark, the 16th chapter, verse 19 and 20, we know the purpose of the giving of the gifts was to confirm the word of God. Friends, let us remember that when the people in the first century heard the gospel, they did not have the New Testament in their hand to check up on the preacher to see what he was preaching as far as the truths pertaining to the new covenant because the revelation had not yet been completed and recorded. So the signs indicated to them miraculous gifts, whether that preacher was from God or not. Certainly God would not authenticate a false teacher by empowering him with the spiritual gifts. So these gifts helped prove whether this teacher was a true teacher of God or not. So it was for the purpose of confirming the word of God. Verse 19 and 20. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. 
And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So the miraculous gifts served to confirm the message of the gospel, the word of God as it was preached. In the book of Hebrews, the second chapter, we have the same principle taught. In Hebrews 2, verse 3 and 4, how shall we escape when we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, that is the apostle, the apostles, with signs and wonders, God also bearing them witness with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So one purpose was to confirm the word of God. But also along with this was the purpose of guiding the early church in her infancy before the revelation of God was complete. The signs helped to guide the early church. We know when the Samaritans heard the gospel of Christ and were baptized in verses 12 and 13, when Philip went down to Samaria and preached unto them the Christ, in verse number five, he was preaching the gospel and doing miracles. But he was not an apostle, therefore he could not lay hands on any of these new converts and give them the gifts of the Holy Ghost. So we read beginning at verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And so... The hands of the apostles were laid on them that they might receive miraculous gifts to guide the early church in its infancy. We note that those who received the gifts were said to receive the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, Acts 8, 15, Acts 19, verse 2, and Acts 19 and verse 6. And again, we emphasize that they received these gifts by the laying on of the apostles' hands Acts 18, 8, verse 17, chapter 19, verse 6, and 2 Timothy 1, and verse 6. But we know that there was a babe in Christ in Samaria, a new convert, who recognized something that many people in the religious world today do not seem to recognize, and even in the church, that it took the laying on of the apostles' hands to confer miraculous gifts. We read of this new convert, Simon, foreman of sorcerer, in Acts 8:18. 8, and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Simon recognized that the laying on of the apostles' hands was required. Now, friends, I hope we'll pay close attention to this because this is important for the rest of our lesson. But then Simon wanted to buy this power. We read in verse 19, he said, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. He tried to buy the gift of God with money. But then, verse 20 to 24, and before I read this, I want to say this. We may have someone here today who needs to do what Simon needed to do. We may have a member of the church who's not been faithful. One here this Lord's Day morning who's not been faithful in attendance and duty to the Lord. Or maybe has drifted into the world and gone off in some way and you need to come back to Christ. Here we're going to read what is often called God's second law of pardon. When people repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, that's God's first law of pardon, we call it, because the alien sinner initially receives remission of sins upon obedience to the gospel. But when a child of God goes astray, they need to come back to repent, to confess their sin and seek the prayers of the faithful. Now let's read Peter's stern rebuke of Simon of Samaria. Beginning at verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, 
For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Now there's the key when a person goes astray. Like the song we sometimes sing, Have thine affections been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? And that's why some people do not come and hunger and thirst after righteousness as they should as a member of the church. Their heart is not right with God. But we read further. Peter said, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Simon had done a very foolish thing in trying to buy the gift of God with money. But in the next verse, we see that he did a very wise thing and that he asked the brethren to pray for him. And this morning, my friend, if you need to come forward, you will do a very wise thing if you come and repent and pray God's forgiveness and ask the prayers of the saints. We read in verse 25, 24, Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. John said that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. And James, in James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. You may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But now, friends, let's look at some examples today of fatal error on the spiritual gifts. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. As a matter of fact, just recently I saw this in a Facebook discussion. Regarding some men, and I think they may have even been brethren, who were teaching error on that which is perfect in 1 Corinthians 13, 10. Now some may look at this, well, that's not all that serious. But I believe when we finish the lesson today, you will see that this leads to fatal error indeed. Let's read it this time in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 8. Paul said, Charity, that is love, never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, that's the gift of prophecy, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, that's the gift of tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, that is a miraculous gift of knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. It is taught by some that that which is perfect in verse number 10 refers to Jesus Christ. Now, beloved friends, we know that Jesus Christ is perfect. He's sinlessly perfect. He did no sin. He never sinned. No, not one time, according to 1 Peter 2, 22 and several other passages of the New Testament. He is our undefiled, higher than the heavens, Redeemer. He never sinned. He was perfect. But we can find that in other places in the New Testament. But that's not what Paul is teaching here. To say that that which is perfect refers to Jesus Christ and his second coming is not only grammatically incorrect, both in the English and in the Greek, but it is doctrinally incorrect. And we want to see why. This conclusion will lead to fatal error. Why? Because... For one thing, it will indicate that the miraculous gifts will last until the second coming of Christ. We know that with that which is perfect has come, that which is in part, namely the gifts, will be done away. They will cease, as Paul is predicting here. Well, if that which is perfect is referring to Jesus Christ and his second coming, then that implies that the miraculous gifts will last until the end of time. Now that cannot be for another reason because when this cessation of the gifts would occur, faith, hope, and love would abide, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And we know that when eternity begins, faith will become sight and hope will be realized. And of course, love will last on throughout eternity. So whatever he's talking about has to be a period before the end of time. 
But let's look further at this matter. The implications are deadly and dangerous indeed. If it be the case that the miraculous gifts will not cease until Christ comes again, that means that there are miraculous gifts for today and until the end of time. And that means that God's revelation is not complete. Now we saw a while ago the purpose of the gifts was for the confirmation of God's word, the confirmation and revelation of God's word. Now if there is still a need for the gifts and if they still occur, that means that God's revelation is not complete and that our New Testament is not all sufficient. It means that we don't have enough that there must continue to be revelations since the first century. Hence, divine revelation would be received after the first century, even until today. But that also has another problem. And that is that Jude, in spite of God, taught that the faith has already been once for all delivered to the saints. Jude verse 3. Jude declared that we are to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints. Now Paul refers to this time when the faith would be once for all delivered in Ephesians 4.13, when he speaks of the unity of the faith. That doesn't mean that everybody is going to agree on matters of faith. That means when God's body of teaching, the totality of New Testament teaching, namely the faith, would be once for all delivered to the saints, and God's revelation would be complete. Another passage is in Galatians 1, 6-9. Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be a curse. Now, brethren, we know that we have taught the truth on this when we tell people like the Mormons who have their doctrine of the covenants, pearl of great price, and the Book of Mormon saying these are revelations from the latter days or more recent centuries. We know that we're right telling them that Galatians chapter 1 condemns the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine of the Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price, or any other so-called revelation from God that has been received so-called since the apostolic age. But there's another thing. If that which is perfect in 1 Corinthians 13.10 refers to Christ, that also means that we need apostles for today. Because the apostles and the gifts go together, as we see in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31. And there's another need for the apostles today, if that be true, which is not. But if it were true, we would need apostles to lay hands on people to give them the gifts. Because again, as I emphasized a while ago, it's very important that we understand that it required the laying on of the apostles' hands for members of the church to receive miraculous gifts. So again, this implies that we need apostles today to lay hands on people that they might receive the gifts. Also, Holy Spirit baptism is needed because all the apostles were baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I'm not talking about MacDever Holy Spirit baptism, which is not real at all. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit baptism of Acts 2 and verse number 4. When the apostles were filled with the Holy Ghost. So if we have gifts today, we have apostles today, we have divine revelation possibly being given today, and also the need for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the miraculous being given as in Acts chapter 2 even for today. Now that means that Paul was incorrect in what he said in Ephesians 4, verse 5, that there is one baptism. And we know that cannot be the case. The one baptism of Acts of Ephesians 4, 5 was not Holy Spirit baptism. Some 20 years later, the last occurrence of Holy Spirit baptism was given in Acts 10 at the house of Cornelius. The one baptism of Ephesians 4, 5 is that which is still intact for today. 
and that is baptism in water, Acts 8, 38 and 39, in the name of Jesus Christ, Acts 2, 38, for the remission of sins. Obviously then we conclude as we interpret the Bible with the Bible that it is impossible that that which is perfect in 1 Corinthians 13, 10 could possibly refer to Jesus Christ and to the second coming of Christ. Now, let's review this matter. If gifts are for today, then there must be apostles today, and we know that's not true. Revelation is incomplete. We've also shown by the scripture that that cannot be true. We see why then it is a deadly doctrine and fatal to teach that miraculous gifts exist for today. Now I want to look at an example of some error that was taught on Ephesians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles. Please turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I heard this when I was living in the United Kingdom in 1999 to 2000. In a meeting, a church workers meeting at the Wembley Church of Christ in September of 1999. There's a well-known preacher in England until this day by the name of Trevor Williams. Trevor Williams was a false teacher. It's just widely known. Brethren know it. It's been documented and proven. Not only on that day did he teach that women could lead prayer in the presence of men. I'm talking about Christian women and Christian men. And we know that's error based on 1 Timothy 2, 8 to 14. He also taught that we need gifts and apostles in the church today. I heard this man say this. And many people over there, they really look up to this man. And this is one reason we can see why there's so much error and liberalism in the congregations over in the United Kingdom. But he taught in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, that a perfect man refers to sinless perfection. Where the word perfect there refers to maturity. I'd like to read now in Ephesians 4, 11, 13. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now we know this passage refers to the miraculous gifts. We read in verse number 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. This passage refers to the miraculous gifts. Trevor Williams taught that since we will never be sinlessly perfect, that we will always need apostles and gifts in the church. Perhaps he thought that he should be an apostle. I don't know. Maybe that's what he thinks. I wouldn't be surprised. But if it does mean sinless perfection in Ephesians 4.13, as he avers that it does, then we will always have a need for apostles and miraculous gifts because we will never be sinlessly perfect. But the fact of the matter is that Paul is not talking about sinless perfection there. He is talking about maturity. James McKnight in his commentary says concerning Paul, he told the Ephesians that the supernaturally endowed teachers were to continue in the church till it was so enlarged and so well instructed in the doctrine of the gospel as to be able to direct and defend itself without any supernatural aid. This advanced state of the church, the apostle termed perfect manhood, and the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, at which when the church arrived, the supernatural gifts of the Spirit were to be removed as no longer necessary. What Albert Barnes says concurs with what we're saying here. He says the expression perfect man does not refer to the doctrine of sinless perfection, but is a figure representing maturity or the state of manhood in contrast to that of childhood. And thus we see that the gifts would last until that time, which did come when the revelation of God in the New Testament was brought to perfection 
and completion as we have just seen in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. When that which is perfect, namely God's revelation to man, has come, when it's completed, then that which is in part, namely the gifts, would be done away. I'd like to read a quote here from uh, Brother David Lipscomb regarding this matter. In 1 Corinthians 13, 11, Paul declares this in this same context. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. Now, like Paul in Ephesians 4, he is comparing the time of the gifts to a time of childhood in contrast to a time of maturity. I thought as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Brother Lipscomb makes this comment. He compares this time of partial gifts in the church to childhood. That when the perfect law is completed to manhood. When the gifts last, he would use and speak by them as he spoke when a child. Now in verse number 12, Paul goes on to say, For now we see through a glass darkly. But when face to face, but then... Face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Then that is a time to come when that which is perfect is come, when God's revelation of man will be complete. I'd like to read this quote from Brother Michael Hatcher. He says, The next illustration is seeing through a mirror obscurely, a glass darkly. Many assume that the seeing face to face in this figure is seeing God himself. This view has no basis in the text. And what was to be seen clearly in the future was presently being seen partially. They did not have an initial vision of God's person but of his will. Thus to see in a mirror was to receive a revelation from God. Face to face indicates the clarity of understanding the clear vision and full knowledge of God's will would come when the revelation process was complete. And so today, we see clearly as we look into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein and are blessed in our work. James 1, verse 25. Before we close here, in just a moment, I would like to uh, read a, a quote here from Brother J.W. McGarvey. In the introduction of his original commentary on Acts, and if you don't have that, I would encourage you that you get it. The introduction itself is worth more than the price of the book, not to mention the commentary. But he says this, and I'm reading this this time, not only in reference to those who teach miraculous gifts for today, but for the lives of people like Mac Deaver and Jonathan Jones and others who are magnifying direct guidance today and who exalt the Holy Spirit above Christ. Now, this is what Brother McGarvey said regarding Protestant denominations. And they're doing this in the disposition to preach the Spirit and His gifts and direct guidance over everything else. The only thing I would add to this comment by Brother McGarvey is that we see this being done among brethren today, not just the Protestant denominations. He says this, Among the prevailing Protestant sects, a common theory of spiritual influence serves almost as a bond of union. It sometimes makes them almost forget the conflicts of past ages melts down the cold barrier of separating creeds and brings hereditary enemies together to worship for a time at a common shrine. It has made the standard of orthodoxy, and to him who devoutly swears by it, it serves like charity to cover a multitude of sins, while to him who calls it in question and contents himself with the very words of Scripture, it is a ban of excommunication. A difference on all of the subjects is tolerated if there is an agreement on this. 
and agreement on all of the subjects can be no bond of union if there is a difference on this. In public discourse, all of the topics are made subordinate. And even the preaching of Christ, which was the work of the apostles, has been supplanted by preaching the Holy Ghost. My friends, this is contrary to what Jesus said when he promised to the apostles, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, Jesus Christ said. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. As we close this morning, have you thought about how these false teachers, while claiming to hold up the Holy Ghost, are actually disparaging him and his work in the things that they are teaching contrary to the Holy Spirit? Rather than magnifying Christ, which we all should do, they are putting down Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. This morning, the lesson is yours. We have what we need today to be edified and to go to heaven. We have the Word of God. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Acts 20, verse 32. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is complete, freely furnished unto every good work. Today it may be that we have someone here who needs to come back to Christ, to come back and repent and pray God's forgiveness and seek the prayers of the faithful. Or we may have someone here who needs to come and to put on Christ in baptism. Would you not come having heard the word and believe, Romans 10, 17, come in faith, Hebrews 11 and 6, in repentance, Acts 2, 38, confess Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8, 37, then do not tarry, do not delay, but arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16, and thereby you will put on Christ because as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ while we stand. And we sing.